Alright, welcome back to Social Studies. We are continuing talking about slavery in the colonies. We are ch chapter... I don't remember. I want to say... Oh, chapter 8. Chapter 8. Lesson 3, it looks like. No. 9, lesson 3. Chapter 9, lesson 3. A daily life on a plantation. A plantation was much like a small village. So, like, that'd be like the village of Ashley. That's a village. Pompeia? I don't Is it village of Pompeia? Is that what it's called? Okay. Plantation was much like a small village. Sometimes hundreds of people lived and worked on one plantation. Hundreds of people lived and worked on one plantation. Just think about that. There were a hundreds of people sometimes that lived and worked on one of these. Hundreds. That's mind-blowing. Do you think there's a hundred people in Pompeii? No. No. Not even close. Yeah, so it's smaller than Pompeii. That's crazy. Okay. All right. Um, the diagram on the next page shows how a plantation was set up. The center of the plantation was called the big house. So here's your big house. That's the center of the plantation. And here we go. Um, where the planter and the planter's family lived. So that's the owners of the land or the planter and the planter's family lived in the big house. Um, the big house was built with high ceilings and thick walls to help it stay cool in the summer. So if you've ever been in a house with two stories, which story is hotter? The top, the high, the top floor, or the lower floor? The top is warmer, right? Because heat rises. Yeah. So the higher you go, the hotter it gets. The lower you are, the cooler it is. So um, they had thick walls. So the thick walls kind of kept the heat out, kind of as like insulation, right? Um, like my Tervis has um, space between. The, there's an inside and then there's an outside of the Tervis. And in between there's air. And the air helps keep the cold, cold, or the hot, hot inside, right? All right, so, um, so the thick walls helped to stay cool in the summer. Many enslaved people worked in the big house as house slaves. All of the captives lived in small, often run-down cabins near the crop fields. And this is the slave quarters. Well, yeah, especially, and I mean, mind you, it probably would have more houses, but it probably wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me if there's more than one family living in each slave quarters, right? Well, I mean, I have, uh, we have, so one of the camps I go to, we have a cabin at, and the cabin is, like, literally an open floor open floor kind of thing before they built it so like so it's basically like this like it's a like a classroom right the the le ground level is like a classroom and then there's a second story that's like a classroom and they have like really narrow skinny stairs from the bottom to the top now there's not going to be in these it's probably just going to be one story it's probably not going to be a two-story thing they, yeah, they look like a tiny cabin. All right, so um, so many en many enslaved people worked in the big house as house slaves. All of the captives lived in a small, often run-down cabins near the crop field. The people on the plantation sometimes called this area Slave Row. Life on the plantation depended on who you were were planters life wealthy planters and their families enjoyed many goods and products that most colonists could not afford to buy for example the big house had fine furniture from england crystal glasses china dishes and silver platters most planters were men but women also owned plantations 
the planter held an important position in the colonies. The courts, as well as the government and business leaders, accepted the planter's view that the economy of the southern colonies would grow weak without slavery. So, when you're rich, which is what the planters were, oftentimes what you say matters more than what somebody else says. And the planters believed that the economy would be crummy without slaves. And so um, business leaders accepted that and they kept their slaves, okay? The slave's life. So if you were a planter, you would have a good life, right? You get to eat off China, you would have a nice life, blah, blah, blah. The slave's life. The day began early and ended late for the enslaved people on the plantation. There was no time to rest under the rule of the overseer. And I think we saw the overseer's cabin the last time, didn't we? It's on the corner. Right next oh, yeah, close to the big house. You're right. I'll show you in a minute. The overseer was the boss of the plantation. He told the slaves where to work and what to do. He was usually the one who punished them. So if you were disrespectful to the overseer, so here's where the overseer lives, right here. If you were disrespectful to the overseer, the overseer would be the person that punished you. He's the one who um, probably whipped. He would have probably been. Now, in some cases, like Freedom Crossing, Martin wasn't Martin whipped by his owner? Yeah. But for the most part, it would be the overseer that whips you. The overseer was often an indentured servant or even an enslaved person. So remember we talked about indentured servants. They came over, they had to serve for seven years, right? And then they got set free. Or it might have been even somebody who was enslaved. The overseer sometimes got a share of the plantation's profits. He therefore pushed the field slaves to work hard from sunrise to sundown. So I don't know about you, but if you are a farmer or um, if you if you got a portion of so if you got if you harvested three three baskets of pickles and you get one basket of pickles for every three baskets wouldn't you work really hard or try really hard? So if you, I don't know. So let's say, let's say you are making, you were, let's say you were the overseer. What? Or apples. Let's say I get baskets of apples, right? Now, they didn't harvest apples down there, but let's say these are my baskets of apples. Apples. If, you're, if the owner says, Miss Richardson, every three baskets of apples you get to keep one, how important is it going to be for us to bring in all the apples? It's going to be really important, especially if I get one out of every three or even one out of every ten, right? So what they would say is sometimes they got a share of the plantation's profits. He, there, he therefore pushed the field slaves, the people that worked in the, the fields, to work hard from sunrise to sundown. Sometimes when there was a full moon, enslaved people worked the crop field at night, night too. Can you imagine working all day and then turning around and having to work all night also because it's a full moon? No, that's crazy. Okay, you and mom garden all the time and it's fun. Okay. But if that was if you worked from sun up to sun down and that was the job you had, would it still be fun? You would get tired out. So right now, sunrise is two 
Seven thirteen is sunrise. Eight oh eight is sunset. So you would be working eleven hour days right now. So if you started at seven this morning, you would work till eight o'clock tonight. That's that's eleven hour. Or, oh my gosh, it's thirteen hour days. Seven to seven would be twelve hours. Seven to eight would be thirteen. And it might, yep, depending on where they live, it could be a different story. You were absolutely right. I hadn't thought about that. So sometimes when there was a full moon, they worked the field at night too. In the fields, Africans did the dirty, back-breaking work of planting and harvesting tobacco, rice, and indigo. Indigo is purple. It's a dye, uh, thing that dyes the co color purple. They also took care of animals, cooked, cleaned, and repaired tools. I don't know about you, Miss Richardson has planted the garden before. It is not fun for me. You have to bend over. You have to make holes in the dirt. You have to plant the things in the lines. Then you have to come back and you have to weed it. If it doesn't get wa enough water, you have to water it. I one time read a story where they would take people out to the tobacco fields and they had to take, um, they had to pick off uh, tobacco worms. The tobacco worm would, could kill their entire crop. And so the first, so their job was to seriously just find the worms off the tobacco leaves, pick them off and take care of the worms, right? And now, it was a fiction book, but in my fiction book that I read, the, the, the overseer said, oh, you missed a worm. And they're like, oh, I'm sorry, I missed a worm. And they said, you missed two more worms, you're going to have to eat it. They had to eat the tobacco worm. Not the tobacco, the tobacco worm. So they missed another one, here's another one, they squished it, and then they found another one that they had missed, and then they had to eat the worm. Now, fiction book, right? But, you know, and that was not slavery, not somebody getting whipped, it was just somebody that had to eat it, right? Gross, I know. Sure. Okay. Um, it says not all, uh, not all the plantation was done, was done in the fields, or not all work on the plantation was done in the fields. Africans who were skilled workers made furniture, shoes, or glass. Some of these skills, the uh, some of the these skills the Africans had learned in their homeland. These skilled workers built many beautiful churches and other buildings all over the southern colonies. Some of these buildings still stand today. So your life, if you were a skilled worker, probably would be a little bit better, right? Generally speaking, the people that worked in the house or the um, in the big house, they had better accommodations, possibly better food to eat, and um, a better life in general. But people who worked in the fields were hot, sticky, and icky all day. Yep, so Martin lived in the big house, yep, and so he would have had a better life than some, right? Good connection. Okay, start over. You wonder what? I wonder what would happen if um, you were, uh, have a school with sword skills. I wonder if what would happen if that was like your only good skill. Like, so well, let's, let's talk about sword skills. Do you want your slave to have good sword skills? No, not really. Not really. So my guess is, is they're probably not wanting, that's not necessarily a benefit for them on their plantation. Um, is this the overseer on the horse? 
I believe the overseer was on the horse, correct. The plantation at night. Most people in slavery said the day never really ended on the plantation. After working in the fields or in the big house, slaves had to do their own chores. They fed animals, cut firewood, and tended to their own gardens. Then they went to their cabins to make supper. After supper, enslaved people finally, finally got to rest. Yeah, I, I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, that's a good question. Um, they were tired, but they made time to talk, tell stories, and sing songs with their family members. Storytelling has been has a long tradition in Africa. Most stories were used mainly to teach values and beliefs. Um, some of the slave songs were signaled to me after work. At the secret meeting, a number of them planned their escape. Some enslaved people also secretly learned to read and later write about their experiences. So they secretly met. Um, so they would sing songs, and we heard one of those, right? The Go Down Moses one. Didn't we listen to Go Down Moses or part of Go Down Moses? So we've talked quite a bit about this. So this would be the tobacco fields they would be harvesting. That's the overseer. A blacksmith shop would be um, any metal work that, that needed to be done. So they would shoe the horses. Um, yep, so they would be repairing carriages, those types of things. Um, the tobacco barn is where they dried the tobacco in before they sent it out. Um, the carpentry shop, they were responsible for building with wood. Stables were for the horses. Um, a hen house, a vegetable garden. So some slaves would have worked all day in the, the vegetable garden for the big house, but they weren't allowed to eat that food. So then they had to work later and do their own vegetables. Um, there's a, uh, the whipping post. We talked about that the other day. That We talked about this is the slave quarters. The laundry, this is where um, people worked 24-7 to, to clean the clothes, the laundry for the big house. Um, the smokehouse smoked food and preserved the food. They didn't have a refrigerator system like we do today, right? And we've talked about, didn't we talk about the water or you you can use do we talk about cutting the ice for the ice house have we talked about that this year putting it in the creek we didn't talk about it so you yeah so putting they put milk or stuff in the creek or the spring i remember when we talked about um in Freedom Crossing, there were several layers of the cellar, and in the bottom layer of the cellar, they had a spring in there, and they figured they used that to cool their food down or keep their food cool. Um, if we leave meat setting out, it gets really icky after a while. Um, this would be the kitchen, and then there's the fruit trees. Struggling against slavery. Most enslaved workers were brought from the present-day countries of Ghana and Nigeria and West Africa. They spoke different languages and had different cultures. The majority, the major ethnic groups from Nigeria were the Hausa and the Yoruba, the Ashanti and the Fati Fa came from Ghana. To keep them from communicating with each other, slave traders and slave owners separated captives who spoke the same language. Why would they want to separate people who spoke the same language? Uh, so they couldn't make plans? Yeah, so they don't want them to make plans to escape, right? So if you can't talk to your neighbors, are you going to be escaping with your neighbors? 
No. So, um, as Captain William Smith wrote in 1744, by having some of every sort on board, there will be no more likelihood of their succeeding in a plot or a plot to escape. Still, enslaved people found ways to communicate with each other. In fact, some African words that they used, such as banana and boss, became part of the English language. Did you know banana was an African word? Did you know, what about boss? Did you know boss was an African word? Rebellion. Captives showed their anger towards their slave owners in different ways. Many enslaved people refused to work. They often died before they can be conquered or forced to work, wrote one Englishman visiting the colonies. Other captives worked slowly or purposely broke tools. Still others escaped. Escaping captives were hunted down. When caught, they were usually beaten, whipped, and sometimes killed. Even so, many kept trying to escape. One thing the planters feared most was rebellion. When they got the chance, some slaves were willing to die for their freedom. That's what we did with the Revolutionary War, right? We had people that said, oh, we're willing to die so that we can be free. Um, in many rebellions, enslaved people organized raids, burned houses, and killed people. In the Stono Rebellion of 1739, a captive named Kato led a rebellion in which 30 colonists of South Carolina were killed. To stop the rebellions, the planters strengthened the slave codes. Well, he was already whipped, right? So if Martin would have returned, it would have been worse than the whipping he got. Sometimes the punishment involved losing a body part. Sometimes, um, like, they took a finger or something um, to, to deter, deter people from leaving. Sometimes they made it next to impossible to escape. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it's kind of whatever the owner wants to do to you, right, is what you get done to you. Yeah. Uh, if someone was caught stealing, they'd have their hand chopped off. Yep. So yeah, you, you could, you could, like I said, you could lose a body part. Um, sometimes if they, you know, you can't really, you know, you don't want. The concern is losing, like if you lose a foot, is it going to be easy for you to stand on it and work? No. But if you lose a toe, sometimes your toes create, help you balance. And it would be more difficult for you to walk and run and leave if you lost a toe. And remember, we talked a little bit about, <coughs> excuse me, we talked a little bit about slave codes, didn't we, with Martin? Didn't we talk a little bit about slave codes? I think so. All right, Stratford Hall, which is below on the left, which is right here. Um, in Virginia was built with the help of enslaved African workers. Most enslaved Africans had little time to create artwork, such as the sculpture from the 18th century. So this is a sculpture that one of the Africans created. Okay. The family. Oh, this is the New Jersey Quaker John Woolman visited many of the English colonies as a traveling preacher. So this was a Quaker John Woolman. The main thing that kept enslaved Africans from giving up hope was their families. Family members tried to keep in contact with one another, even when they were separated. On the one day that they did not have to work, usually Sunday, enslaved parents often visited their children. Some parents walked miles to see their children. 
who had been sold away from them. One such child was Charles Ball, whose word you read at the beginning of this lesson. So let's go back and look at that. My poor mother, wrote Charles Ball about his time as a captive in the colonies during the 1700s. When she saw me leaving her for the last time, she ran after me, took me down from the horse, clasped me in her arms, and wept loudly and bitterly over me. So his mom went to visit him. Why it matters. Enslaved Africans had a major effect on the English colonies. Slave labor played a large part in building much of the South and some of the North. Profits from slavery helped all the southern colonies become wealthy and successful. In a land that offered much freedom and opportunity to its European colonists, the plantation system denied such freedom to enslaved Africans. One of the few European colonists who spoke out against slavery in the 1700s was John Woolman, a Quaker. We just looked at his picture up here, right? In 1754, he wrote, The color of a man means nothing in matters of right inequality. Woolman traveled through much of the southern colonies and gained firsthand knowledge about slavery. Woolman also asked slave owning Quakers to release. Their captives, Quakers and other colonists, did beginning, begin to free their slaves. In 1791, the Virginia planter and slave owner Robert Carter III said that slavery was against the true principles of religion and justice. He began freeing the, the 500 enslaved people on his plantation. So one slave owner owned 500 people. Yet these efforts did not end slavery. The struggle by African Americans to gain the same rights of most Americans continued. So it says, slavery was practiced throughout North America and in the English colonies, but most enslaved people worked on large plantations in the southern colonies. A plantation was like a small village in which enslaved people did m almost all of the work. African captives rebelled against slavery in many ways. Strong family ties kept many from giving up hope. What hope would you have if you know that tomorrow you have to wake up and go back to work? And the next day you wake up and go back to work. And the next day you wake up. So it would be like six days a week you go to work for, what, 13 hours a day right now? And you don't get paid for it. You don't get any benefit from doing your job other than if you do your job well, you don't get hurt, right? That's the only benefit that you really have. So their families mattered a lot and they did a lot with their families. Yeah, so they probably would hope that somebody would come rescue them. If, if all you do is, you know, wake up, work, and go back to bed and work, and then wake up and work, do you, does it matter if you try to escape? Escape might be the only choice you would have, right? Yeah. All right, we'll talk to you later. Bye.